Someone once said, for by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. Do you know who said that? Next on Polygamy, what love is this? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith. All of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free, but I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom, a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me, and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, Polygamy? What love is this? Welcome to our show tonight. This is Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen, and we come here every Thursday night and talk about polygamy or something that has to do with polygamy or the origins of it. Um, we have an announcement before we get started. Um, Lynn Wilder, who has been a guest on our show several times, and she was also our guest in September. She talked about her book that she has written. It's called Unveiling Grace. And she and her husband are in the area again for the next week or so. And she's going to be speaking at different venues in the area. And for those who would like to go hear her talk about her book and about her experience and her family's experience of leaving the Mormon church, we are uh, putting up on the screen the venues that she's going to be at. Friday, tomorrow night, October 25th at 7 p.m., she'll be here at KTMW Channel 20 in the show What's Up Utah. And Sunday at 6 p.m., the 27th, she'll be at the Red Hills Baptist Church in Enoch, Utah. Tuesday, October 29th at 2 in the afternoon, uh, the Salty Believer podcast from Risen Life Church in West Jordan. And then Wednesday, October 30th, she will be here again at KTMW TV 20 at 8 p.m. on Ancient Paths uh, with Jason Wallace, the TV show that night. So if you didn't get all these and you would like to see uh, Lynn Wilder speak and, and listen to her and talk to her and meet her, she's a sweet lady. You'll love her. You can email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com and we'll be happy to send you this information by return email if you did not get it tonight. And also during our show last week, our guest Kathleen uh, Melanakos um, discussed the research that she had done on the history of counterfeiting in early America, which included the family of Joseph Smith. Well, one of Smith's polyandrous wives, Sarah Cleveland, was arrested for passing counterfeit money. And we had a caller during the show, uh, Scott from Draper, who challenged our a guest by questioning if Sarah Cleveland was convicted of counterfeiting. Our guest explained that her research hadn't taken her that far. After the show, we did receive an email from a man who is a former BYU professor, and he questioned Scott's purpose in making his call. And I would like to quote part of the email that we received. He said, this is an old lawyer's trick of sophistry that is similar to a magician's sleight of hand. The magician uses distraction to focus the attention of the observer away from what they do, uh, what they do not want the observer to see. It is a form of hiding truth by distracting people. If I don't want you to focus any more on counterfeiting, I ask a question about conviction. Now we are talking about what I want to focus on and taking the focus off what was said before. 
It's simply a form of manipulation that works wonderfully well, and many of us get caught up in it before we recognize what just happened. I believe Scott from Draper's intention was to discredit the presenter through sophistry rather than discredit the sum of facts presented before his call with better information. In the absence of better information, discrediting, uh, discrediting the witness is a sophist's best and only trick. In other words, his actions really validated your arguments because he had no better facts to, officer, to offer. He did you a service. So we want to thank Scott from Draper for this service. And, you know, it's very true. He said these in words I would not be able to say. And the point is, Sarah Cleveland was uh, passing counterfeit money and was arrested for that. And that was the point that our guest was trying to make. They were involved in counterfeiting money. So, during a discussion on our show a few weeks ago, or a few months ago maybe now, we quoted some early Mormon uh, comments by Brigham Young and others, and quotes that placed Joseph Smith on an equal level with Jesus Christ, and in some cases on a higher level than Jesus, in both accomplishment and esteem. There are many more comments in, uh, in early Mormonism that deified Joseph Smith to a level equal or higher than Jesus. We thought we'd share some more of those comments tonight. So take a deep breath because there are some mind-boggling statements from early Mormon polygamous leaders that place Joseph Smith on much too high of a pedestal. The only per place a person can go who has been placed on a high pedestal is down. And the higher the pedestal, the further the fall and the greater the crash. Early Mormon polygamists, beginning with Joseph Smith, of course, preached polygamy. Every one of them taught that polygamy was the way of the gods. It was the economy of heaven. It was the only way to exaltation in the celestial kingdom, a kingdom that doesn't even exist. Brigham Young promised damnation. Joseph Smith promised destruction. And polygamists today continue to threaten destruction and damnation to those who don't want to share their husbands with other women. Polygamous dogma insists it is a privilege for women to have a man who is already married. And women seem to flock to the beds of these married men for the sake of eternal life and the mythical promise of becoming a goddess in the coming ages. In making our case against the polygamy doctrine, we must necessarily prove the reliability of the men who preach the doctrine. These men teach a secret religion. They have been deceitful, and what they teach opposes biblical revelation. We have carefully chosen the quotes that we're going to use tonight to help our polygamous viewers and anyone who is bold enough to search for God's truths to help them understand that early Mormon leadership fulfilled Jesus' warning against false prophets and the wolves among the sheep. Tonight, our co-host is here with us, Earl Erskine, and he's the former Bishop <laughs> Earl Erskine, yes. and uh, he's going to add his thoughts to our discussion. So thanks again nice. for coming, Earl. Nice to be here. It's nice to be here. always great to have you here. A lot of interesting stuff tonight. There certainly is a lot of shocking things. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> so let's look at some quotes that elevated Joseph Smith to status equal to or better than Jesus Christ. One is where Jesus, or where he takes the, kind of takes the place of God in his King Follett discourse. Yeah, he sure does. He said, My father worked out his kingdom with fear and trembling, and I must do the same. And when I get to my kingdom, which is Godhood, I shall present it to my father so that he may obtain kingdom upon kingdom, and it will exalt him in glory. He will then take a higher exaltation, and I will take his place, and therefore become exalted myself. <laughs> okay? Joseph Smith is taking God's place and going to be exalted himself. He said so. Had a confident view of his future, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he certainly did. Well, he practiced polygamy, so that was going to get him there, I that guess. Was, that was a big part of it. The more wives you have, the greater <laughs> godhood you get. That's what we're taught. But Luke 14, uh, 14, 11 says, and I quote, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, <laughs> and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we wonder what happened with Joseph when he crashed. 
off that pedestal. You have a quote from Heber C. Kimball. I do. There's a lot of these, and this is a good one from the Journal of Discourses. It says, uh, you, you call us fools, but the day will be, gentlemen and ladies, whether you belong to this church or not, when you will prize Brother Joseph Smith as the prophet of the living God and look upon him as a god and also upon Brigham Young, our governor. Is that strange, isn't it? That, it is. That, uh, Elevating him to Looking a, him to God, as God, yeah. as our God. And, yeah. and Jesus is relegated to the place of Lucifer's brother and robs God, uh, Jesus, of his divinity. And Joseph Smith is elevated up to the place of God. Kind of scary, isn't it? It, it is. <laughs> um, we have a parallel chart here. Uh, that we want to share with our viewers. It's a chart that was used in 1922, which actually would be only, um, what, um, 18 years after the Second Manifesto where they gave up polygamy. So they were deifying Joseph Smith. And we're going to talk about how they compare Jesus with Joseph in their Sunday school lessons. So let's go through this chart. The first one is, the column is Jesus the Redeemer, and the second one is Joseph Smith the Prophet. The first one is uh, the advent of Christ and the advent of Joseph Smith. Um, so you want to do the comparison there that's can. on the Let's, screen. On the screen, okay. Uh -huh. the, Jesus the Redeemer, at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ, the national religion, which had satisfied the parents, no longer proved satisfactory to the children. Under Joseph Smith, at the time of the birth of Joseph Smith, the world was in con convulsed with religious discord and the people were not satisfied with the teaching offered by the churches. And so Jesus brought in a religion and Joseph brought in a religion. Yep. They've got him. The next one is that the parents on the Jesus the Redeemer, the parents of Jesus were of humble origin and the parents of Joseph were of humble origin. Well, we could say that of a few billion a people, people, couldn't we? The voice of God is the next one. The voice of God proclaimed the Christ at his baptism, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The voice of God spake unto Joseph, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. The next one is, under Jesus the Redeemer, Christ presented himself for baptism, and he was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. Joseph Smith, John the Baptist, appeared to Joseph Smith and conferred the Aaronic priesthood upon him, and by the authority of that priesthood, he was baptized. You know, it's interesting, he conferred the Aaronic priesthood on Joseph Smith, but you know what? Jesus didn't even get the Aaronic priesthood. No, it was reserved for the, Levit the tribe of Levi, the Levitical priesthood, and mm -hmm. uh, it's surprising that John the Baptist would come and give the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood to uh, Joseph Smith, who wasn't from he, the tribe of Levi. Who wasn't from the tribe of Levi, exactly right. Mm -hmm. And of course, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, so he wouldn't have the Levitical priesthood. Yeah. Okay, the next one. Christ demonstrated the power of the priesthood by healing the sick, etc., and he bestowed this power upon his disciples. Joseph Smith, by the power of the priesthood, healed the sick, and he conferred this priesthood and power upon his disciples. Okay, so we still have the equal power going on where they have yeah. equalized the two, and there's no equal. There is no equal whatsoever. And the next one was, Christ was persecuted, and the message that he gave to the people was rejected. Uh, Joseph Smith was persecuted, and the message that he was sent to deliver to the people was rejected. But do you compare the message? Uh, Jesus didn't come and say polygamy. Jesus didn't come and say the United Order. He didn't no. come and say all of these things that Joseph Smith came and said. And Christ was the great high priest, and Joseph Smith tried to take that position as well in the church, certainly. Well, and Jesus was God in the flesh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even Matthew true. chapter 1, I think it's verse 26, tells us that. Yeah. So, And then this is one that the, the uh, all Mormons take great pride in. Christ sealed his testimony with his blood on Calvary, and Joseph Smith sealed his blood with, or his testimony with his blood at Carthage, Illinois. Okay, and so actually there was a, a big difference in the way that happened. Uh, Joseph Smith was taken out in a gun battle where he shot two people. He shot more than that, but he killed two people. Jesus, J Jesus went to the cross because he did that to pay for our sins. 
Well, the interesting thing that would <laughs> is that we make this comparison at all. How, yeah. how do you compare yourself to Christ to, as God uh -huh. in any sense? And have this as a word teaching message or yeah. whatever it was yeah. uh, is just incredible. It is yeah. incredible. It, it's, at, it's, it's, <laughs> uh, it's to the point of blasphemy, actually. Well, let's get to Brigham Young here. He taught that a man should not be embraced in your faith. Yet he embraced and exalted Joseph Smith beyond imagination. He praised and exalted Joseph Smith more than he did Jesus. He said, and I quote, Let me tell you that I have not embraced any man on this earth in my faith, but I have embraced the doctrine of salvation. And it is no matter what the people do in Utah. Here is the doctrine of salvation. Talk against that prove that to be false or find a flaw in it if you can. Never embrace a man in your faith, for that is sectarianism. Well, <laughs> let's see if Brigham Young lived up according to his own advice like, and see if he might have got carried along yeah. with some kind of contradictory statements yeah. here. To talk about not embracing a man, and yet he says this, uh, I feel like shouting hallelujah all the time when I think that I ever knew Joseph Smith. Oh. <laughs> and I am an apostle of Je Joseph Smith. All who reject my testimony will go to hell, so sure as there is one, no matter whether it be hot or cold. So to even call himself an apostle of Joseph Smith Joseph is Smith. a little blasphemous. That if he, if he was truly an apostle of Jesus Christ, who we know should be an eyewitness of Jesus' life, death, and burial, and resurrection, mm -hmm. but uh, to call himself an apostle and then to say it of Joseph of Smith. Joseph Smith. And he blasphemy. doesn't embrace a man in his religion. Yeah, uh, that's he, true. he contradicted <laughs> himself here. He also admitted that there's a hell, which uh, today's Mormonism does not admit. Yeah, um, there's no doubt, of course, that Brigham Young embraced him. He, uh, they accepted the testimony of, of Joseph Smith, uh, Brigham Young, and others. But they rejected God's own testimony and Jesus' own testimony about himself. You know, uh, people give testimony all the time. We hear that in all of Mormons, whether it's polygamy groups or the mainline church. They have to give their testimonies. But let's see if it matches up with God's testimony about himself in the Bible. John chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? They believed what Joseph Smith said about heavenly things, yes, did. but they didn't believe what Jesus spoke about heavenly things. And it, <laughs> And if they had accepted what Jesus taught about the heavenly things, they would never have come up with three kingdoms of glory or spirit prison or baptism for the dead or any other myths about heaven that they have. And then we have 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through, th through 13, talking about his testimony. Quote, We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which He has given about His Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because he has not believed the testimony God has given about His Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. That's God's testimony. <laughs> have you ever heard a testimony of anybody that includes that? No. I have never. No. Not unless they're Christian. Then, of course, we can hear that. But not in this culture. They never give God's testimony. They give their own. And it is not true because only God's testimony. God's testimony is greater. So uh, God's testimony is rejected. And Jesus said, you, re you, you accept man's, but you don't accept my testimony. That's not good. So one of the places that where Joseph has replaced Jesus is who they were to confess, just like we've talked about in this. What, to, what did Brigham testimony? Young say? Yeah. yeah. And he said this in the Journal of Discourses, whosoever does not confess that God has sent Joseph Smith and revealed the everlasting gospel to and through him is of Antichrist. 
Isn't that shocking? <laughs> yeah, it is. Especially when we just read the testimony in the Bible of what God's testimony is, and that's that we confess His Son, yeah. not Joseph Smith. Well, one thing I sensed when I came out of the church was that it was between me and God. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, and there shouldn't be anything between me and God. That's right. And if there is, it's Jesus who is the mediator between right. man and God, mm -hmm. not the church, not Joseph Smith. Uh, absolutely. And why, how could that be anti-Christ? It wouldn't be anti-Christ, it'd be anti-Joseph Smith. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have another quote here about um, oh, salvation. This is, a, this is a good one. Uh -huh. If we get our salvation, we shall have to pass by him, Joseph Smith. And if we enter our glory, it will be through the authority he has received. We cannot get around him, Joseph Smith. This is from an apostle, George Q. Cannon. Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? Yeah, it is very interesting. And what is interesting is that the Bible says that we will all appear either before the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment. And Joseph Smith is going to be there along with the rest of the sinners to be judged with the sinners. He's not going to be sitting in judgment on anyone. But... God says all judgment has been given to Jesus. None of them has been given to Joseph Smith. John 5, 22 says, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. So we see that the judgments to the Son. Don't worry, Joseph Smith isn't there. You don't get your little brownie points by letting Joseph Smith be the judge. Jesus alone is the judge. I have another quote from Joseph Fielding Smith. He said, There is no salvation without accepting Joseph Smith. If Joseph Smith was a prophet, and if he told the truth, no man can reject that testimony without incurring the most dreadful consequences, for he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So here we have Joseph Smith instead of Jesus Christ in these places. Yeah, it's praise to the man, always. <laughs> it is. And even in, our, in the testimonies that you're talking about, probably polygamous as well as current church, is, is uh, mainstream church, is this testimony of, Jesus, of Joseph Smith and the, mm -hmm. and the church. It's not about Jesus and mm -hmm. his salvation and mm -hmm. his grace for us. And you know that he had two ifs in this. He said, if Joseph Smith was a prophet, and if he told the truth, well, you know, we did a show one time a little over a year ago where, where we did the timeline of polygamy. And over and over and over, year after year after year, Joseph Smith denied polygamy. Yeah. He denied he was living it. He lied about it to Emma. If Joseph Smith told the truth, that's a good question. Did he ever tell the truth? I don't know. Section 101 of the Doctrine and Covenants said that they didn't practice polygamy. You know, one man <laughs> should have one wife. It, it, Lying seems to be part of this whole uh, lying, thing. Lying yes. for the Lord. Lying for the Lord. And, and they say without confessing Joseph Smith yeah. that, that, you, that, that nobody get will heaven. get there. But you know what Acts 4.12 says? If you know your Bible, you would immediately know the lie because you would know the truth. Acts 4.12 says, talking about Jesus, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Sorry, the name of Joseph Smith, as these early polygamous men would have you believe, is not that name. It is the name Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no salvation without Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith doesn't take his place. And that includes when you believe in Jesus, that has to be everything the Bible teaches about him. It can't be a pick and choose buffet bar. It's every Everything the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ, which means Jesus was not a polygamist. He is not Lucifer's brother. He is God, and He has been God from everlasting past and will be God from everlasting future. The only God, Isaiah 45, 21 and 22 says, and there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. It doesn't say turn to Joseph Smith and be saved. No, there's only one God. <laughs> so all of these quotes these early Mormon people were saying yeah. about Joseph Smith and how great he was, it's all just blasphemy. 
You've got another quote here that says, so Yeah, from another Brigham one from Young. Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses. It says, No man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter into the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. Every man and woman must have the certificate of Joseph Smith, Jr. as a passport to their entrance into the mansion where God and Christ are. Joseph Smith's Reign, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph Smith reigns there as supreme a being in his sphere, capacity, and calling as God does in heaven. Oh, mercy. Oh, I'd be they, afraid of a lightning bolt out there. They've missed the mark. They just, uh, they've turned their head. They've just, they've just, and they praise this Joseph Smith uh, to, to such an extent. But look where they placed him, you know, right up alongside God. We've got some well, even worse quotes of this coming up. he did that himself, too, as we've read already, that he was he's rated to take God's place. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And, of course, 1 Timothy 2.5, which you already kind of talked a little bit about, says, For oh. there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, and it's not the man Joseph Smith, it's the man Jesus Christ, and it's only Jesus who's our mediator. We don't go to priests, we don't go to prophets, we don't go to bishops, we don't go to uh, our stake leader or yeah. our, our polygamous prophet or leader, nobody but Jesus alone. Jesus, uh, no one comes to the Father but by me, Joseph, uh, Jesus said. Joseph Smith claimed, and here is one of the most blasphemous uh, comments that Joseph Smith made. He said, come on ye uh, prosecutors, ye false swearers, all hell boil over, ye burning mountains, roll down your lava, for I will come out on top at last. I have more to boast of than any other man had, than ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. Mm -hmm. I boast that no no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. When they get rid of me, the devil will also go. Whoa. So he and the devil are working together? Is that what he's saying? Kind of sounds like when... Uh when he goes, the devil will go too. That's, but you know what? He's gone and the devil's still here. So I don't know what that's all about. This is the, <laughs> this is the quote that kind of tipped my wife out. Of, uh, finally, kind of, finally convinced her that maybe what I'd been learning was, uh, had some truth to it. Uh, and that boasting. Uh, you it's know what? Shocking. Have you ever read an early Mormon history where they ever preached grace? No. I have not read any early quotes where they preached grace. They didn't. They preached works, 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 and more works. And there were many early Mormons who ran away from Joseph Smith, especially when polygamy started coming out. Boy, did he ever run, and they're still running from him, by the way. Well, you've got one about Whoa. him being a big lawyer. Yeah, I, I've never heard this one before. <laughs> Joseph Smith, it's in the History of the Church, Volume 5. It says, I am a lawyer. And I am a big lawyer and comprehend heaven, earth, and hell to bring forth knowledge that shall cover up all lawyers, doctors, and other big bodies. <laughs> a lawyer or I don't know how many of, out there have seen Jim Carrey's Liar, Liar, but his little son says in his classroom, he says, uh, my dad's a liar. And the teacher keeps saying he, he's a liar. And it finally, she, he says, yeah, he does it in court. Oh, and she says, oh, he's a lawyer. But I've never, I don't <laughs> she, know why Joseph Smith would refer to himself as a lawyer. It's uh, Because he was bragging so much about it. I can know. comprehend he's, he's all of these things. And I guess maybe he thought lawyers were, yeah. were big, smart people. But, you know, again, we like to go to the scripture and compare what Joseph Smith said and did with what, uh, what lines up with what God said. And so we're going to compare this with 1 Corinthians 1.20 where it says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? We think so. And 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29 says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And Joseph Smith said himself he had more to boast about than any other man had. And this says no man will boast before God. 
I think these are characteristics of a controlling organization, though. You know, very they, much so. They build up the, especially the king or the uh, the important person in this case, Joseph Smith, and in religion they tear down Jesus or make him reduce him to something less than he mm -hmm. is, and then they put uh, distrust in the Bible, mm -hmm. and that's the way they control. And that's their, they get them. They control the people. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got another big boastful okay. quote here from him. Yeah, another history of the church. The whole earth shall bear me witness that I, like the towering rock in the midst of the ocean, which has withstood the mighty surges of the warring waves for centuries, am impregnable. Ooh. And I am a faithful friend to virtue and a fearless foe to vice. No odds whether the former was sold as a pearl in Asia or hid as a gem in America, and the latter dazzles in palaces or glimmers among the tombs. I combat the errors of the ages. I meet the violence of mobs. I cope with illegal proceedings from executive authority. I cut the Gordian knot of powers, and I solve mathematical problems of universities with truth, diamond truth, and God is my right-hand man. Oh, there you go There's again. There's humility that, here, that, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, <laughs> great humility there. Uh, again, he's he's bragging about his uh, his knowledge, you know, the yeah. things that he knows and the things that he can do. So again, First Corinthians chapter eight, verses one and two says, "We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know." No. And we would put this on Joseph Smith's tombstone. Okay, it looks like that we are where we need to break um, and open up the telephone lines for our viewers. We do have a lot more to share, so uh, continue to stay tuned, if you will. Our telephone number is 801-973-8820-973-TV20. Uh, we'll take your telephone calls if you want to add to this, make comments make objections or whatever, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And while we're waiting for the calls to come in, we will share our message with you. You are watching Polygamy, What Love Is This? Broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This program is the broadcast outreach of A Shield and Refuge Ministry. Shield and Refuge is a point of first contact for Mormon fundamentalists who question the doctrines of the religion or who are actively seeking for an opportunity to escape the polygamist lifestyle. Examining the claims of fundamentalist doctrine against the backdrop of biblical truth is central to our efforts. We invite you to contact us. Call toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at TV at aboutpolygamy.com. We want you to know that we've made available to you some outstanding resources free of charge. You will find them at our website, www.whatloveisthis.tv. There you will find the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, which documents the real-life stories told firsthand of those who were lifted out of the culture of polygamy through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Also, free of charge to you, is the booklet, Is Polygamy Biblical? It explores plural marriage in the context of God's Word and answers questions like, Did God ever command polygamy? Is it part of God's plan? While you are at our website, make sure to take advantage of the archived episodes of this program, which can stream on demand directly to your computer. There are more than 100 shows to choose from. And if someone you know is unable to view this program via live broadcast, recommend that they visit this same website every Thursday at 8 p.m. Mountain Time to watch this show through live streaming video. Simply follow the links to the live streaming video page. If you are watching live tonight, we invite you to call us as we open our phone lines. The number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Now, back to Polygamy, What Love Is This? with our host, Doris Hansen. Welcome back to our show tonight. This is Polygamy, What Love Is This? And I'm Doris Hansen with our co-host, Earl Erskine. We're here talking about some of the ways the early Mormon church lifted and exalted Joseph Smith up to 
uh, the level of Jesus and many times even higher than they esteemed Jesus Christ. Uh, some of the boasts that we have uh, read and discussed are quite shocking and we hope that we've uh, got our viewers to check these things out, to maybe even get mad enough that you, that you say, I'm going to check this stuff out. Go for it. Uh, we, have, we give you the sources of our quotes. You can go check it out yourself. Practically everything we use is in Mormon history. So it's easy yeah. to really check out. Yeah, the, we're not making these things up. No. They're not contrived. No. So we've opened up our telephone lines. We'd love to hear from our viewers. Uh, give us a call and we will talk to you on the air or answer your question. Very quickly, we have two calls waiting right now, but very quickly, I, I just need to say this. Uh, I have a quote from Sydney, R Sydney Rigdon, who wrote a letter to Orson Hyde that said, um, it was the imperative duty of the church to obey the word of, not Jesus Christ, but <laughs> Joseph Smith. And that if there were any that would not, they should have their throats cut from ear to ear. That is what you're dealing with. And again, you can check this out. That's what it said. Instead of the imperative duty of the church to obey the word of Jesus Christ, and then if we don't, we have the opportunity to repent. We have to obey Joseph or have our... Oh my goodness. Can you imagine Jesus <laughs> preaching a sermon like that? Sounds like blood atonement or oh, something. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it is so shocking. Okay, we're going to take some phone calls now. We're going to take a call from Cheryl in Midvale on line one. Hello, Cheryl. Hi, how are you? Hi, Cheryl. You're hey, on uh, the I, I have a question. Uh, this holy garment stuff, where did that come from? Because I'm curious, because if it's my underwear that makes me holy, then it's going to go up without me. Because, you know, if Jesus got to sort through all that underwear or whatever, I'm just curious where it comes from. <laughs> Do you know where the holy garment come from? Well, yeah. I, it was it was a symbol of what uh, God gave to Adam in the Garden of Eden is what the at least what they teach in the temple, and that's where the garment comes from. That God gave it to Adam and Eve in the garden. Right to be a protection and a, and a covering for them. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's not in the Bible, so obviously that isn't true. And what? of course, the Masonic symbols I don't think were in the Garden of Eden. I don't not. think the. Uh, no. Compass and the cross and all that other stuff was in the Garden of Eden, but then that's for the people that go to the temple to have to well, decide. Well, because my, my cousin, who's, who's Mormon, she says she keeps a, a, set of it, you know, a set of garments in her car to protect her. I'm going, oh, yeah, that'll work. Well, <laughs> you know, again... I just never understood the concept of it. Cheryl, let me explain. We, we mentioned earlier that the, the Bible says that there's only one mediator between man and God, and that's the man Jesus Christ. It's not garments. Okay. God is our protector. Garments aren't. Uh, nothing is. Nothing is our protector except, um, except God. You know, I mean, we don't need little, little yeah. talismans like that to, to protect us when God is our protector. And seatbelts, of course, you use your good sense. Yeah, but yeah, the, gar I just, the I garments. I'm curious about because no one could give me an answer. So I thank the, you so much for the answer. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Cheryl, you're, you're the, welcome. the garments do come from the temple. Where that's where the first time you put them on, they're supposed to be a protection. They came from the time when Adam was given them in the Garden of Eden, and you're supposed to wear them the rest of your life. Oh, horrible. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks appreciate for calling. It. Thanks for calling, Cheryl. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm, bye. Okay, we have another call That's here. Very hard. Um, I really like that. Well, okay, do you want well, to ask her a question? I, now, I yes, we won't do that. Well, that was line that, three. The I name, think. oh, line three? Yeah. Okay. Line three, we have Brian calling in Bountiful. Yes, I had a question for Earl. Um, the Mormons believe that Jesus was a god, the god of the Bible before he came here, and they said the gods made the world. Does that mean that they there were gods too before, like Jesus before they came to become a man, that they were gods too, and they helped them make him the world? I think I caught most of your question. You're asking me if, if, of course, you know that the Mormons teach that Jesus was a god before he came to the earth. Is that what you're asking? Yes, and I was wondering if they believed that they were a god too and helped create the world. That they believe that they were gods too and they helped create the world. Well, the, the Mormon church does teach, well, the, and so did the polygamists, that the gods created the world. Y yeah. 
um, in fact, I've actually called this a fatal flaw of Mormonism because if Jesus was a God before he came to the earth, then he didn't have to come to the earth. There was no way that he needed to become a God. He didn't have to come here to get a body or to be baptized. Or, And then if he was a God, then according to Mormonism, he had to go through a temple. He had to be married for time mm -hmm. and all eternity. He must have been a practicing polygamist. And mm -hmm. it's a, That's it's actually doctrine. a fatal flaw. And you I know think. that we were taught differently. We were taught that he came here to earn his Godhood. Right. This was the oh. final the final place and the, the death on the cross that Jesus yeah. did is the final thing he had to do to become a god. And yet, was he the he, Jehovah of the no, Old Testament? No, we were never taught that. Okay, well, I don't know in, if that's what they're teaching now, but we weren't taught In mainstream that. Mormonism, he is the Jeho did, did Jehovah. They, did, the, did the other Mormon people like Joseph Smith, did they believe that they were gods before they came to the earth? Did they believe that they were a god? That we were? Uh, Joseph yeah. Smith. No, we're... Um, no, we had to come to the earth to get a body to progress toward Godhood. That's what we so had to do, asking. yeah. We, we had to have a body to progress, and there was eternal progression uh, in every and, and step Jesus of the And Jesus was just that one of our brothers, our oldest brother. Again, that's yeah, the... They, they say that, that Jesus, that Heavenly Father and, and Jesus and Michael created the world, was the more gods that, that created the world, They believed that Jesus, Jehovah, Michael were, well, I don't know about Michael, but Jehovah was a God of the Old Testament. I don't think they believed Joseph Smith was a God before he came to the earth. No, if that's they, what they, you're asking. They think he is now, but not. they didn't think yeah. he was before. Okay, that was my question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. Thanks for calling. Okay, uh, and, and we're talking here about um, the, the, some main problems that took place in early Mormonism, um, which, which makes everything that came out from that flawed. Because if you have the wrong foundation, just like Jesus said, yeah. you're not going to get the right, a good building that's going to stay on that foundation. And when you're trusting in man, that's always a problem because man, men don't know. And obviously, and, and uh, he, Joseph Smith was morphed to changed his mind about different things, and mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't a god. He wasn't speaking for God, but he's been elevated. Been so much so by these people that dealt with him. And, and our question is, when you start having these questions about Joseph Smith and th some of the things that he did, uh, w w this boasting that he's doing, do you really want to embrace a man like that in your own, as your religious foundation? You know, and, and all of this is mixed up in what Joseph Smith did and said with polygamy and child brides. Um, he had child brides. Uh, the United Order, which is better known as religious communism, and you won't find any of those kinds of behaviors by God's uh, prophets and disciples in the Bible. And so if you're armed with this, this information, which is what we're trying to do, is, uh, is to get you to go check it out and then turn to Jesus and forsake and forget Joseph Smith and all his doctrines. Uh, just like Paul did when he went to the jailer, um, or when the jailer came to Paul in Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 31, the jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Doesn't they believe in Joseph Smith or polygamy or the United Order or, or temple marriage? Yeah. Any yeah. of these things yeah. at all. Yeah. So believing, of course, in Jesus. Believing in Jesus is believing and accepting as truth everything that's taught about him in the Bible. That is very important. You cannot redefine him and then say you believe in him. Um, now, Earl, you had um, a couple of things that you kind of was on your heart about. Some of the misused scriptures. Well, Joseph Smith, as I said, changed a lot of things. In fact, that's what started drawing me out of the church was the changes that I found in the Book of Mormon. And one of the things I had to deal with was um, the Bible because Joseph Smith had told me that, uh, that I couldn't trust the Bible, at least as far as it was translated correctly. So 
one of the things I had to do was kind of deal with some of these scriptures that, that affected me that I knew uh, from the growing up in Mormonism. And if you want me to cover a couple of those or mm -hmm. at this point. I, I'd like you to cover um, 10, 16, but let's take a couple of phone calls okay. here and then we'll go directly <laughs> right. to that, okay? okay? So on line two, we have Rick calling from North Washington County. I think that's what it says. Rick? Yes, hi, Doris. I just, I just wanted to say, God bless you. I, I've only been watching you um, for several months. My wife and I are new to Utah. We've been here about a little over a year. And uh, we moved, when well, we were traveling in our motor home, we were retired. But what I wanted to say to you is, is I, I've been studying the Bible for a long time now. And I have uh, been studying a lot about prophecy, end time prophecy, which I believe that we are at the cusp of I mean, we're entering into it as, as more and more time goes by, we see these things evolving and prophecy coming true. Well, one of the greatest prophecies that, as far as uh, a world prophecy I see, is, is the, the great harlot riding the beast up from hell, and she is the leader of the false church. And I have come to the conclusion, and I'm not an expert on this, but it seems to me that it's a conglomeration of many churches. I was raised Roman Catholic, and I, I went against that when I was 16. Um, took a lot of heat from my family, still do. But, um, you know, this is, this is not right, all these things. You know, I, this is, I mean, to hear the things that Smith has said and people believe that, we down, we down here have been approached several times by the missionaries and this and that and the other. And, and I got to tell you, when they were telling me the things they told me, I was like, whoa, you're an idolater. That's what all of you are that think the way you do. Jesus is the brother of Satan. You said it tonight. I feel blessed by listening to you. Well, thank you. And um, I've never met you. And my wife has never met you. But we feel like you are our sister, and we are certainly your brother and your sister as well. And I mean in Christ, because that's the only way. I was a bad sinner, and I got saved, and it's like every day I have to work at it. Mm -hmm. Every day. That's and right. And it's like, and without that, I've got nothing. That's and right, it's like to be saved and to know that I still sin bugs me more than I can tell you. But I have to repent. I have to humble myself, and I do. That's right. But That's right, this really. is part Thank of you. that false church. And these men that go around and strap these people into hey, this, Rick. whether it's that false prophet Menson right now, or any of those loser apostles around him, they're heading for hell. Every okay, one of them are going to hell. So Rick, and that's all there is to it. We wanted, I have never, ever we, heard this kind of stuff except what I studied later you. on in life about <laughs> the popes of the Vatican. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. just as evil. Thank you, Rick, for calling. We appreciate your call. We appreciate your comments uh, and your reading of the Bible. We're really getting low, low on time here, and we do have another caller waiting. So I do appreciate your comments. And I agree with you in uh, the, the, the Lady on the Beast in Revelation is the compilation of all the false religions all of the false religions. It's not just one religion. We have a call call coming on line one from May in Washington. Hello, May. Hello. Hello, May. Hello. You're on the yeah. air. Yes, you're on the air. Doris? Yes, this is Doris. Hi, Doris. How Hi. are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. I love your show, and I do have a comment on what's being talked about tonight. Okay. And uh, my husband and I have been reading the New Testament and enjoying it very, very much. And the writings of Paul are so humble, and he gives Christ credit for everything. In fact, he belittles himself and says that he needs to improve and be better. But he's very humble, and I think it's very easy to see a real prophet, mm -hmm. if he is a prophet of God, because Joseph Smith seemed to like to take the credit for anything he could. He did, and he took credit for things that he shouldn't, too, as well. So <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's yes. That's true. But, Anyway, that was the message I had. It's just uh, wonderful, and, and uh, we love listening to your show, and we're learning a lot from you. Well, thank you, May. I, I, are you the May I think you are? Uh-huh. Okay. Well, it's good to talk to you. Thank you very okay. much for calling. All right. Talk to you later. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye. Mm -hmm. 
she's a lady who has been uh, emailing me now for months and months and months about the show, and uh, she uh, has been, you know, out of the LDS religion, oh. and and so she's Thank quite you. excited to find the truth in <laughs> Jesus Christ. So it was nice to talk to her. Uh, so very quickly, you know, once, why don't we do John ten sixteen? Once your eyes are open, it, it certainly makes things a lot easier, and 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 the problems in in early Mormonism, polygamy, and current mainstream Mormonism, if you can step back and take a good look at Joseph Smith yeah. and realize what he was really more all about, mm -hmm. it answers so many questions. And, and get in the Bible. It's like this Rick Hall from, Bible, yeah. yeah, just get in the Bible and read the New Testament and pray that God would show you the yeah. truth of what's in there and compare it. Just yeah. compare it with some of the things that Joseph Smith taught. You can't come away from there believing that Joseph Smith was a true prophet. Yeah. Jesus is the one we exalt, and uh, only Jesus. So I had some of these scriptures, and, I, and we may not have enough time tonight to do too much to this, but John 10, 16 is one that we used a lot in, in, uh, on my mission to support uh, Jesus after he died visiting America, mm. visiting the Nephites and Lamanites. And it just says... And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Well, what's interesting is, in, especially in like uh, Isaiah 49 and so on, other places it talks about Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So I think the only two groups, two folds, were Jews and Gentiles. That's right. And uh, since there were only these two, and, and another way we used to use this is that he would visit. I think most Mormons, most people would read this, people that read the Book of Mormon would say that it says he's going to visit them in America. And all it says is that them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That yeah, doesn't so say he's going to visit them at all. It's kind of a misconstrued way that we've looked at that. And if people will actually read the Bible, put the verses in context, especially their favorite scriptures from, mm -hmm. from polygamy or from Mormonism, and put those to the test in context of what the Bible says and what the verses actually say, yeah. I think they'll find out that they're probably misreading these scriptures, and even though they're used all the time. They're used all the time, but they're taken out of context, yeah. and, and so you can't even know what they're referring to unless you get the context. You've got yeah. to be able to get that. You can't apply your own interpretation to it. No. It's not up for interpretation. Peter tells us that the Bible is not up for any private interpretation. The Bible means what it says, and we don't get to tweak it to whatever <laughs> we want it to mean for ourselves. Okay, looks like we have another call on line two. We have Jean from Lehigh. Hello, Jean. Yes. Yes, you're on the air. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for what you have presented tonight. It's really uh, cleared up a lot of things for me, who comes from a long, long line of Mormons from the handcart way back. But my mm -hmm. point is this. The church nowadays is all about money, power, and control. And they're too much into business and not enough into what a church should be about. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And you know what? Uh, so are the polygamy groups. It's the same thing with them. Yeah. They're into the making the money. They're into power, power over women and children and control. businesses. Yeah, and it's control. the same exact thing. The only difference is they do the united order and polygamy. But everything else is the same. They have their yeah. own special prophet, you know, of course, yeah. the only true prophet, by the <laughs> way. And, 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 but it's the same thing that they are trying to perpetrate on their members. They're not as open as far as accepting new members no. as, uh, as the church is. They want to keep it very closed yeah. and secretive. Okay, can you, let's see, we've got a couple of minutes. Can you do the, the one oh. about Stephen? Yeah, maybe I'd uh, skip that one if it's okay and jump up to the celestial Okay. Uh, kingdom. Um, it's an interesting one be only because uh, we use this all the time to show how heaven's divided up. It's 1 Corinthians 15 40 if we have that graphic. It says there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And uh, that's 1 Corinthians 15 40. And what it's actually saying, the verse just before that is verse 39, and it says, um, where did I put screen. that? 
Oh, it's on the screen. Verse 39 says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. And then the very next verse is the one that I just quoted. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Well, if you most, I don't know about polygamists, but most of the mainstream Mormons would read that, uh, that that's the celestial kingdom and the terrestrial that's kingdom. That's the way the polygamists believe And it the well. telestial, by the way, doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. Right. And so, but all Paul's talking about here is that there are heavenly bodies, there are fish, fish bodies and men bodies, and now there's celestial heavenly bodies and there's terrestrial bodies, and it has nothing to do at all with uh, celestial kingdom. And, and, and terrestrial means earth. Earthy, yes. That's earth. what, terracotta is an earthen yeah, pot, it's, and that's what it means. And the, that's the way the Bible means it. It means yeah. what it says. And, and you know, you so look at the sun, heaven, and the sun the has a different glory than the moon, yeah. and the moon has a different glory than the earth, and, and that's what it's referring to. I think all Joseph Smith did was take the T, or the, yeah, the, the C off, celestial and add the T to it and made celestial. That's Sounds all like did. it, doesn't it? Sounds you know, when I, when I was first doing my studies, I, I looked up the word celestial in the dictionary yeah. and it wasn't there. And I thought, oh, he coined a cute word there, didn't he? Now, it might be in some dictionaries that are keeping up to date with, some, with religious terminology, yeah, but with, with it wasn't now. there because it's a, it's a word that he coined and didn't really exist. So, um, yeah, there are no three levels of, of glory. We, we get all the time people that will email or call and say, it's in the Bible. The three kingdoms of God are in the Bible. Um, and then they quote those verses, yeah. get it all the time. Yeah. And, and from that, where do they get that the top celestial kingdom has three kingdoms? Well, again, it was just Joseph Smith decided that. And what's interesting is he uses the word degree, mm -hmm, three is, degrees of glory, which is a very Masonic kind of a phrase, the it, 33 degree Mason and so on. So, exactly. And again, I, as I've said before, with the Kirtland Temple being built in 1836, Joseph Smith didn't have any of this masonry kind of stuff and marriage for time and all eternity in, uh, in the Kirtland Temple. He only did it in the Nauvoo Temple after he had become a 33 degree mason. And so. Yeah, and he was big on those Masonic things and on the degree things, like yeah. you said. So yeah. he, he took a lot of that and incorporated it in it. So thank you for coming again My tonight. My pleasure. Uh, it, it was interesting. You. Thanks for all your hard work. And, and thanks <laughs> for watching. We appreciate your watching. You know, anyone who is considered a prophet yet does not believe and teach in agreement with the Bible, God doesn't recognize him as a prophet and neither should we. Every Mormon prophet, whether LDS or fundamentalist, has taught or does teach what the Bible is against, and that includes polygamy, temple work, genealogies, word of wisdom, the united order, and several dozen other non-biblical commandments. The Bible instructs us that we are not to recognize them as prophets, those who do not teach what is in accordance with sound doctrine. They, the, the, these are wolves among the sheep. They are wheat, tares among the wheat. They're the false prophets that Jesus warned us about in Matthew chapter 7 and chapter 24. When Jesus asked you on judgment day, why did you follow your prophet instead of following what he said, what will you say? Isaiah 8.20 says, if they don't speak according to this word, there's no light in them. Although the, uh, the Bible, we, all through the Bible, we read warnings. We're told how to test for the truth. We're exhorted to test the apostles to see if they're false, to test the prophets, to test the doctrine. Living in spiritual darkness while believing that you're walking in the light is a spiritually dangerous place to be. In fact, it is spiritual suicide. Jesus said that if our light is darkness, how great that darkness is. Jesus himself is the light of the world. It is he, not polygamy, not Joseph Smith that saves. It's Jesus. It's him who makes us right with God, not works, not religion, not your church, and not celestial marriage. Good night.